My name is Carol Streloff. I was born in Yorkton, Saskatchewan. I lived uh, on the farm nearby and uh, went to a one-room school. The uh, children around were all just like, like us. We had very little and uh, we were able to go to school till grade eight, then we had to take correspondence, and then the last year I managed to go to school in town, which was not a very satisfactory thing, but I did it. And after uh, school, I went to work for the Saskatchewan government telephones, and um, I was with them two years, and a girlfriend persuaded me to come to Vancouver. And um, I worked in the for the Bank of Montreal for about a year, and I saw this ad once in the paper about wanting recruits for the Wrens. So I didn't know anything about the military because we had did not have anybody in the family that had served in the military. And um, so I got myself down to HMCS Discovery, which was a sort of a challenge in those days, as I recall, and signed up, and, and I did not know what I was doing. But um, anyway, they, I signed, signed on the dotted line, and um, I was in. I was still working in the bank, of course, and I was to appear every Tuesday night to finally start my career in the Navy. So I did that and eventually we were issued uniforms and um, the uniforms were, um, we were very fortunate and there was a lot of leftover supplies from World War II which had finished several years prior, but the quality of everything was good, it didn't fit but that was all right, that didn't seem to matter. And I, we took, the first thing, of course, we were told to, um, uh, we learned was marching and keeping our heads up and don't scratch your nose or anything like that. And, and we were taught by the ex uh, chief petty officers that had served in the Navy, so they were not exactly, they were nice, nice old men at the time, we, that's not the right way to say it, but we, they, um, they were also very kind and very helpful. So we gradually moved on, there'd be one course after another, but basically the evenings, all evenings were started with marching and pre precision and we learned to salute, of course, and um, then eventually, um, as time passed, the first requirement is to take uh, basic training, and the basic training then was H HMCS Cornwallis for everyone. So we went by train to Cornwallis, which was, I, I would never have gotten there otherwise, I guess, but we had the usual, again, more marching and basic courses in, in the rules and roads uh, of, of the Navy. And uh, I think that went well. And when we uh, came back, we were back at Discovery, and I was enrolled in the TAS department, which was um, Torpedo Anti-Submarine Control. And we were taught by the various sailors um, on, on what that was, which was underwater radar. And that took place all of the first winter, I guess it was. Then the second year, there was an opening at, several openings for Wrens that wanted to volunteer for special duty at HMCS Star in Hamilton, Ontario. And that, that was conned, which was the head office of the Naval Reserves uh, for all of Canada. At that time we had 23 Naval Reserve uh, depots across Canada like Edmonton, Calgary, Saskatoon, Regina, Winnipeg, and several in Manitoba and several in Quebec and the Maritimes of course. 
So um, my first, my next trip was to HMCS Statacona for further training, and we were actually taken out onto um, the areas where the, the men had trained during the war, which was uh, detecting ships that came into Bedford Basin. And I think uh, we took a, we'd go out for the day and take along the, the give us cooks who gave us wonderful hefty meals. And um, therefore, um, the, thus went Staticona. They were quite strict there, and the, a lot of high-ranking uh, men of the Navy were uh, stationed, of course, in Halifax, because at that point, uh, the threat of hostilities in the Pacific were still very evident in the theater of war over there, so they kept we would be taken on, our sea time was a day trips on one of the small HMCS ships um, to, out into the Great Lakes. Well, that was great for us, we thought. We'd, we'd sunbathe on the deck. And so I spent several months at HMCS Star and then came back to Vancouver and um, carried out my, I, I did make one more trip back to Staticona for training uh, because at that point I had tra uh, the TAS division for the Wrens was discontinued and we, um, I went into the meteorology department which was starting out very new and of course meteorology then was very, very uh, basic, uh, but it was very interesting and I really liked that, but my five-year term had come to an end also by that time I was married, so it wasn't always just so easy to get away and take the required two weeks training, which would have taken place over at uh, HMCS Naden in Victoria or be sent east, so at that point I left, I left the Navy. When I left, I was a leading wren, and I was um, out for a short time enjoying my, my freedom away from the Navy because I felt I'd done my, my duty, but I was soon recruited to the uh, Renettes, which came under the Navy League of Canada, which were very active, and they were the girls from, at that uh, time, they were 12 to 15, and um, so I joined uh, the, uh, the, it was called the, the uh, HD Stone Corps at um, HMCS Discovery and we met again every week and we had 90, up to 90 girls of those, those ages during that time and um, we taught them everything, seamanship and ropes and protocol and f signaling and things like that. And I progressed from being um, a sub-lieutenant to a lieutenant, and my, um, I spent three, the first two years as a divisional officer, and then ab about three years as a executive officer or more, and then my final years I, I was commanding officer of the E.D. Stone Corps when I we decided I had contributed enough and uh, and uh, I le left, uh, retired from there. I spent a few years just being at home and working and gardening and what have you. And uh, then in 19, uh, 1993, my husband and I, uh, he had been a sea cadet at HMCS Discovery for many years and um, uh, so we joined the Royal Canadian Legion at Branch 60 in West Vancouver and um, uh, during that time uh, we volunteered for everything that we could do. We helped a lot with the poppy campaign and various drives that we had to raise funds for the veterans hospitals. And it, it, my husband was on the uh, executive committee a great deal of the time. He set up the 
membership program. The first time they used to do it on with paper and pencil, and um, they graduated into computers. So. Um, I worked with him setting up because at that point we had about 800 members in the Legion and um, uh, he did that for many years plus it became as he was a very uh, loved the Navy discipline as I did too. He was sergeant at arms at the um, at Branch 60 in West Van and I used to uh, at, participate in, uh, as a member of the color party for many years, which was a, a very rewarding and a proud thing to be able to do. And so we attended a lot of, um, of uh, ceremonies throughout and we continued that right up until uh, quite recently. A color party is made made up of a group of people, mostly uh, people that, that have had experience. I was just sort of tossed into it by my husband because he was a sergeant at arms and always needed bodies. So, but I happily went along with it, and I, my coordination is reasonably good, so I was able to do so. We attended various functions, <clears throat> well, unfortunately uh, celebrations of life were a lot of those, and um, parades of course, and, and anything where uh, uh, the Legion was required to be present, they usually had a, had a color party, and uh, it was a, a, very, um, a very rewarding thing to to have done people and people always like to see the military and they like to see the flags if we um, always carried first the Canadian flag the Union Jack the provincial flag and the municipal flag plus NATO NATO flags and depending on be, depending on the occasion, if it happened to be a European country, that would be represented as, as well. And um, the sergeant at arms had to look after if there, we had visiting, where a visiting ship, for example. I remember occasion where when we had a, a ship from Mexico, and uh, it's up to the people to provide their national anthem, which can sometimes be a challenge, but it, it always seemed to work, I, I think. So um, uh, my time in, as a member of the color party was uh, always, uh, you, you felt very proud. I, I don't know why that was. I guess I just happened. That's the power of advertising. I just happened to see the ad in the, in the local in the Vancouver Sun. I guess, and then once you're in with the Navy, you're so proud of it. And there's considerable competition, so you know <laughs> you put all your efforts in into that. And so I never never gave any thought. Um, uh, about that. Many girls like to join different things because of the uniforms. Well, uh, the Navy was the least uh, attractive. When, uh, when I was at HMCS Star, it was summertime, and, and uh, knowing uh, the Great Lakes in summer, it's very, very hot and humid, even though we, our, the base was right on the water. And um, we were issued dresses that had been issued during World War II, and they were just a plain lightweight material with gold buttons down the front and a, a white collar and, and cuffs that you had to wash every night and iron and, and put back on the sleeves. And they, the, these dresses were so unattractive, the seamen at the, uh, at the gate used to call us the home for wayward girls. <laughs> so you, you can picture that. So anyway, I uh, would ne have never thought anything of joining the Army or no disrespect or Air Force. Uh, I just wasn't, I wasn't a great student. I never, I could pass an, a, a, a math exam. I was good at literature, and I enjoyed that, and, and geography, which to this day I, I like 
enjoy both. But uh, no, I was not uh, because I, I I was so be I felt I was so behind because having to sort of struggle on my own doing correspondence. We would do the car. We were out on a, a mail route. The uh, lessons would come to us, and we would. Um, uh, do our lesson and mail it back to Regina, the head head office at the, at the time. So I guess I got through that okay. And I believe at the end of the year I had to go into town to write a final exam, and my marks were never v very high because my I just wasn't a really clever clever student. <laughs> Um, I, I think, well, my parents, they, they were very loving parents, but um, uh, also very, we minded them. If they said, do it, you did it. Like my dad, he said, uh, we would say, well, I can't do that. And he'd say, there's no such word as can't. <laughs> so um, I've always liked discipline and following the, the rules. I've met people in different, uh, that have come from elsewhere that say, laws are made to be broken. I've never thought that way. Um, I think um, that laws are made by people that have experienced things. I know we all, we don't agree with a lot of them, but, but they're there, so follow them or do something about it. When, uh, when I joined the uh, Navy League and uh, one of the first questions as, as an instructor, we would ask the new recruits why they joined the Renettes and they'd say, because we want the discipline or we like the discipline because we don't get it at home. And I've never forgotten that and I think it applies a great deal to generations that have come from that, but uh, that was a very good lesson to uh, know. Well, uh, our lifestyle was, it, as soon as you were able to walk, you worked. So we worked along with our parents. Uh, we did not have electricity or a vehicle or anything. We had horses and we had coal oil lamps. And um, we grew everything that we eight in our gardens and raised chickens and animals. And um, we had very little contact with the neighborhood children because we were all a mile or so apart. We would meet at school. Uh, there were about 23 of us at the school usually, grades one to eight. And um, we, um, so we had very little contact with the, with the outside world, but we had a happy, healthy life and uh, couldn't beat it. So uh, as for the children in town, we thought, oh, they're lucky they, they have cold pop and things like that. But that's about, about all I can remember from, from that. But we worked, we weeded gardens and it was hot and dry and, and um, it, it, but it was a good training, and I think today it's a factor in the fact that nothing really bothers me or upsets me, be it temperature or people or what have you, so it's, it's a good background for, for anybody. We used to, be, we'd, we'd build houses. In, in the winter, we'd have a skating rink. Uh, which was mother's wash water from the from the Monday washing, and we'd bank the snow up, uh, uh, clear the lawn, and and um, we'd have a skating skating rink. It'd probably snow every day, but we cleared it, and we had old skates that my dad had brought from Winnipeg back in in the 1920s. So we had these old skates, and we had sticks for hockey sticks. <laughs> But we played. But we always said we're glad to, when school used to finish the end of June and start the first week in September. 
Um, except for some years, we'd go back August the 1st because the winters were so cold back then that we wouldn't go back until February the 1st, so they evened the school year out. But we used to say, you'd be so glad to get back to school because it's not holidays, they're work days, because that's all we did was work. Oh, that was in the old days of a switchboard where you had a crank telephone that you wound the crank around until you got central, which was the, uh, and, and the uh, often a lot of the, uh, of the small towns had uh, switchboards and some of them would be in the lady's kitchen, but she'd be the operator for that town and she was very respected and held a great deal of power. And um, so uh, it was um, quite interesting. I was in CAMSAC my first uh, year and a half before I transferred to Regina. And um, in Cam everybody knew everybody. And there were rural lines, so when the phone rang for Mrs. Jones, everybody on that line would listen to Mrs. Jones. <laughs> and so that's how, how we got a lot of our news. You know, and um, so it was. And when I went to, this would amuse people today. When I went to Regina as a newcomer, the first thing they do, you uh, you were put on the shift for time, and people would phone into the telephone office for the time, and you would have to sit. And the the station was behind a large switchboard, hot and airless. And you would sit there and you'd just say, 901, 901, 901, because people would phone in and you could, even though you, you just did it when the light came on, you knew somebody was out there trying to get the time. And, um, but you just had to sit there and the number of times I remember falling asleep. And I think the shifts were quite long too. You had to stay awake. One, one of the things with regard to my childhood on the farm was at the, the fact that uh, I guess it would be the government of Canada uh, asked that people collect bones, dried animal bones, and aluminum. So we used to scurry about the countryside collecting these bones because there had been a lot of antelope uh, antelope and I'm not sure about buffalo in, in the area, but the bones being a, the dry country that it was, the bones quite well preserved. So these bones and any aluminum that we could possibly um, recover from old cars that had been, and machinery that had been left in the ditches, we would gather up and I guess our dad would take them into the elevator, which was the collection area for this process. And these uh, bones and aluminum, they went to, I, I would think, to the Toronto area to a munitions factory because they were gathering up everything possible that they could turn into munitions. So it must have been quite a successful program. And at the same time, we were on rations, but very small because we grew everything that we ate. But we were rationed to sugar and we were given stamps. And I guess when you went into the local town, Mr. Smith's grocery, you they had to give a stamp and then you were allowed so much sugar because they were, con sugar of course was much, was going towards the munitions uh, end of things. and. Uh, so I don't remember too much about that, but I remember Mother being very careful that we all had our own share. And uh, we ha had six jars of sugar on the counter, and we would have competitions as to who could eat less, not more, but less. And at the same time, I was thinking that some of the older farm boys in the area joined the services. There were quite a number of them, as a matter of fact. 
and um, all of them, as I recall, came back safely and settled back in on the farms. And at that point, they were a few years older, so wanted their own homes, and they were assisted by the Department of Veterans Affairs to buy land and, and settle at that time. No, I think we were excited any time we saw anything that, no, that, that it wasn't, it didn't, we didn't consider it work. It was great fun and competition, I suppose. We were just, you know, small children at, at the time, so um, no, it wasn't considered work. It was a diversion. <laughs> I don't think so, uh, because we were just busy going to school and and working and on uh, to help our parents, and uh, we of course uh, through the party line we would hear from their mothers that all all was sell, safe, and uh, of course the ladies' uh, circle. Uh, we all I I remember knitting scarves. Uh, we were given wool, I believe, I suppose the government somehow or other arranged that, and we were given wool so that um, any of us that could knit, and that's when I learned to knit, uh, we knit scarves and gloves, gloves and uh, toques uh, for, that were sent over overseas to the, to the uh, army. But um, all, everybody sort of pitched in and did what they, what they could. Uh, the, these are not, the, the one pin is uh, from HMCS Discovery, it's just to commemorate the unit that I belong to. Uh, the, uh, the medal that I have is, was given to the Legion members here uh, at the 75th anniversary of the beginning of Branch 60 in West Vancouver. So that covers that, but the rest are, one is, the one is the Tudor crown and that was just pre presented for various functions that we had. And uh, the other one, of course, is my life membership in the Legion, which I was given, in, uh, given the honor of in July of, of 2005. A life member is, is uh, awarded to uh, people that have spent extra time with the Legion and are, and uh, of good character and um, it's quite, it's a, quite an honor that your uh, fellow comrades recognize you as being that. Um, over the years, I've I've done a lot, uh, quite a few very interesting things. For ten years, I coordinated the veterans' visits to the schools in West Vancouver. There are, uh, are seventeen schools there were at that time that uh, the veterans visited, and the the the, um, t the uh, principals of the school would invite the veterans and to attend the assemblies that each school would have. And when I first started, which was, started doing this was 1998, I had at least 200 members that I could draw on to cover all of the schools and I was able to do that. But as the years passed, the veterans became scarcer and um, there were very few people. But uh, so at the end of my tenure of uh, the 10 years that I did it, uh, there were very few people, but they did carry on, sort of at, um, d volunteering on their on their own. If they had grandchildren or children going to that particular school, they would do it on their own. So unfortunately, uh, they could not uh, do it the way we were able to do it in the early days. But it was very rewarding because. The, the, we would speak to the, in some cases, speak to the children, and they would listen and were very interested, most of them, 
and uh, because so often they had grand grandparents that had been in the military, so they would know slightly, a little slightly about the military. And I also, my husband was sergeant at arms of the color party there, and um, um, I was soon just handed a flag and <laughs> said, become part of it. <laughs> which I did, I enjoyed it. We would attend parades and uh, memorial services for a lot of the veterans, which was not a, well, an, an honor to do it, but a sad, sad occasions. And uh, church services occasionally, and um, parades, of course, and uh, various events that would happen around the city. The color party would be called and there again there was a, a great number of us we when I first started there would have been at least 20 to call on but uh, as time went on it changed and it now which is very a very fine thing to do they have to rely on many of the older cadets from the various uh, services other than that I just uh, enjoyed helping the the legion on any committee I, I could do, I, and I helped my husband a great deal. He was membership chairman and set up the new membership from a pencil and paper system to the new computer system that they still use today, I believe. Um, well, we met in two ways. He worked across the street at, at uh, A.E. Jukes, the um, investment people, and I worked for Pemberton Securities, so he used to come in as a, uh, to d deliver stock certificates, so I met him there, and then also we met at, at Discovery. He had been with the uh, Sea Cadets for a number of years, but um, when I joined, he was a recognizable face, <laughs> so we were married for 61 years. <laughs> Uh, in the Sea Cadets, I think he was just a general seaman, but when he, he moved on from Sea Cadets to the ship's company at HMCS Discovery, and he, he um, uh, reached the ranks of um, Petty Officer Second Class with uh, um, three, three stripes, which is unusual, but he, he, which meant that he, uh, he, he'd put in the time but did not get the promotions, but he had that. And then um, uh, uh, he, he, was, he was in long enough, 14 years long enough, to be awarded the Canadian Armed Forces Decoration. He was very, very proud of that. Um, meteorology was quite new and I remember it at one time I was the only student taking it and um, with, uh, the um, uh, officer that gave it to me so uh, I think I spent the better part of a training year uh, l learning that but that was about the extent of it because then the, there wasn't, uh, wasn't enough interest so the course was cancelled. And I, I think it was about that time that I just, uh, that I was finished my tour of duty and, uh, and left the, the Wrens. Um, I, I, I don't think so. The way women were in the permanent services, I think they were, gradually getting more resignation, uh, recognition and um, uh, able to uh, join branches that they weren't otherwise able, able to do, but they, it was sort of an uphill battle all the time. So I don't, uh, by that time I had left, and of course there's been so many changes since, but because the, the men were always first any, anyway, and we didn't, in, in those days, we just didn't give it any thought that's the way it was. And so 
we didn't know any different. <laughs> Oh, oh, I believe so, yes. Uh, women speak out now, whereas we didn't. Here's a, a, a little item. When we joined, um, when I joined, uh, we were issued a full kit, complete with a great big beautiful duffel bag. <laughs> Not very glamorous. And we were issued with our, our ties, black ties, and a bow tie, and uh, gym socks and gym sh shorts as well as our, uh, there were no pants uh, that I recall for women then, our jackets and skirts and shirts. And um, when I left, the storesmen still had that, and that's with just a pencil and paper system of keeping things. The uh, uh, storesmen, I, I knew I had to bring return my kit, which had been, you'd been wearing for five years, but they still wanted it back. There must be good reason. And I returned everything that I had in good condition, but I was missing my gym socks, and they charged me 26 cents for those, and my bow tie, for which they charged me 14 cents. <laughs> I will always remember that, and I, I think the the store the store keeper just enjoyed a, another beer on us. <laughs> Even my duffel bag, which had been tossed about out from trains and different different things, was not the clean one that I had received. But they didn't; they got it back. I think it gave me more more confidence. I've always been quite shy around people and coming forward, and uh, but it um, it gave me confidence. That's the most thing, and it widens your like. I knew nothing about the military, but I've certainly over the years become very aware of it and keep up to it to this very day as to what is going on because it's amazing a, a number of people that you mentioned something and they just have no idea what you're talking about there so it's it's a broadens one's mind tremendously i feel when you know what's going on in other parts of the world and there's lots going on Um, I have lived in West Vancouver since 1962. We were in our our home um, right up until this this um, summer when I sold the home. But uh, yes, oh, things have changed tremendously. All of the when I came over here, uh, Park Royal was only um, a, a strip mall on the north side and a very nice little shops. You know, there was Woodward's uh, general store at one um, uh, end, the north end, and <clears throat> where you could buy absolutely everything you ever needed. And then at the, at the south end was the vegetable uh, market. And in between that, there were all kinds of nice little shops, tea shops, chocolate shops, dress shops, a wine making store, and uh, Kitchen gadget store, anything you would want, and that was, that was Park Royal. Then it was in, I believe, the '60s, later in the '60s, that Park Royal South started, and of course we all know what it's like today. And also, when um, our turnoff from Marine Drive was 29th Street, and up from 25th onward there were no sidewalks so it was just a two-lane road one coming one going as i recall and um, uh, nice nice homes which now have been demolished and um, replaced by large homes and also um, there were a lot of children we used to have about 64 children right in on our street now we have zero or 
maybe maybe two or three, but there just aren't the children that uh, were there. And because I, I know that very well from Halloween, when the number of candy bags I used to give out at the door now, for the last few years, I would have, I'd have my candy bags ready, but no children. I think um, it, it used to be a pleasure to go to Vancouver, and I worked over town right from the time that I came to Vancouver in 1949 up until my retirement. And um, things used to be, uh, it was a nice city. Now it's just over overwhelming. Every, every building has, go, has gone and replaced by high rises and um, um, just quite, quite different. But then that's, it's, it's 2020 now, so it has to be. Well, I, I think it happened in the la in say the last uh, ten to f uh, ten to twenty years uh, since, uh, uh, which is the time that uh, I no longer went downtown to work every day and uh, to, to go there again. It's just uh, so I, it was sort of in that during that time where things really changed in the early twenties. Tw yes. Mm -hmm. Um, I made friends with a, a girl from Niagara Falls, and I, I met her when I was uh, uh, stationed at HMCS Star in Hamilton. And uh, she, she used to take me home, uh, to her home on weekends in Niagara Falls, and, because I remember they had grapes hanging over their kitchen and everything. It was just a lovely, lovely spot. And she and I kept corresponded right up until recent years. She's no longer with us, unfortunately. But, and we traveled to New, New York together, and she was just one of these people that um, we just clicked right from the start. We had a lot in common. We loved music and, and um, travel and it, interesting interesting thing. She was a very interesting person. We do have two or three. One in particular is now the sergeant-at-arms, a very fine young man, and um, he's been in Vancouver in a few years now. I'm not just uh, too sure, but a very fine young man, well-trained and always looks so smart and uh, nice but um, and of course I I don't know how many but we would have some members from the Bosnian era and um, it was funny uh, I just learned not too recently I guess through TV uh, when the, the legions were formed of course that was just shortly after World War one and then when the World War two people, uh, veterans came back. The World War, the, there was, they didn't um, get along too well <laughs> because the World War I thought that the World War II people had it pretty easy and maybe in some respects they did. So the, I guess over time th that was sorted out because the World War I fellows were on the decline. And then World War II, but then I believe the same thing must happen now, or, or it did happen, um, that uh, the World War II veterans um, sort of resented the Bosnian, but that was a very bad war. And uh, so then as now, as we're run very short of any veterans at all, from, because the numbers are so small from these two previous conflicts, um, they, they now have, have brought in uh, civilian people. It used to be relatives, but now it's, they've even dropped that just to keep the membership up that, so that anyone, even though they have no connection with the military, um, 
are able to join so that they don't have the same background or knowledge of um, what, what the, the, the Legion is all about. Uh, it, it, oh, it's quite different because it nowadays can resemble more like a sports bar downtown. Uh, they, they have no knowledge of the um, uh, of the purpose of the legion. They're very most people are good at volunteering when asked, but uh, it's just a, another club. I don't like using that word, but that's that's how it is. So it's so important that the older, and they're becoming very few people, and I'm much credit to, to them that do keep the interest of the Legion together. It won't last forever, but we hope it does. Um, well, I would re recommend the cadet uh, services. Um, very definitely because there is such uh, a good opportunity for, for them to learn their discipline. And the one thing that the uh, cadet services uh, emphasize when they do join, they, they must not become lax uh, as far as their education. They uh, promote that just, uh, just as well. And there is an opportunity. Um, uh, for them, uh, especially in the Air Force, because they, uh, the young ones are taken out to the flying places and learn uh, a lot about um, uh, aircraft and uh, so many. And, and of course, boys are very keen on uh, <coughs> on engines and aircraft, and so so are the girls. And the girls are right in, and it's very nice to see the leadership that the girls do take on in the. Um, uh, services. When when I was with the Navy League, there the girls were all by themselves. There was no, and the sea cadets were the the boys. They were all you know separate areas. Whereas now uh, it's uh, all together. So and that and that's very good. Oh. My goodness, I, I really do not know. I was certainly very proud of having been in the services, uh, I can tell you that, but the rest, I always um, d did a good job at everything. I, I know I'm bragging, but I did a good job at everything I did, <laughs> or I didn't do it. There was, there was no ha halfway with me. I think they should um, be thinking of how they got there. Nowadays it's so, so different with the, the new age and the electronics that they should be thinking back of where did they come from. And I, you, you, it seems to me that you don't do, do that until you're much older, then you start, start thinking uh, that uh, where you're, you're parents come from, but I think um, to be able to reflect back and remember about their dad and their granddad and great-grandfather is very important. I do keep in touch with the girl that was my executive officer, Willene, and then another uh, friend. They're, I consider them two of my best friends. Uh, because when you get on in years, you don't have too many friends. <laughs> they're, they're not with you. And uh, my other friend, Judy, in um, Edmonton, she has been a very loyal friend, phones me every week. And uh, she was one of my Renat officers when I was at Discovery, as was Willene, of course. Mm -hmm. When you think of it, my um, our district was my great uh, my great grandfather came out in nineteen in eighteen sixty three. Like I used to think that was a long time ago, but it it wasn't. And 
uh, like my dad was born after the Riel Rebellion and things like that. The, it, it wasn't really the way things move nowadays. It wasn't uh, a very long time ago. And, some of the, and we used to find the odd arrowhead from the Na Indians that roamed the plains, you know. It all sounds very romantic to, to people nowadays, but it really happened. And, and when I stop and think about it, that my dad came out to the, and his dad and, and brother came out when all of these hostilities were, had just finished, sort of, well, they never finished, but uh, finished. and. Um, uh, that, I don't feel it was that long ago now, but interesting times. People actually living oh, in that uh, area? Oh, they're where? And uh, you know, I've, I've talked to my sister recently about this, this because they had their own school uh, up along the highway. We never saw them. And, um, but they lived, lived somewhere and kept to themselves very much. There was no, no trouble whatsoever that, that I can remember because we didn't know them um, at all. But they were certainly very evident at the time. I think my my dad was a pretty headstrong person, but you had to be. You, you know, it was a hard hard life because um, uh, when he moved out to the farm and things were, where, um, you know, they practically lived in a tent. To but anything because the government gave them land, leased land, and um, to to get the west moving. They're still trying to do it, and uh, so I, I think it was uh, my dad was sort of like that. Mum followed along because, uh, like, my mother never wrote a check until she was on her own when my dad died in '72, and she had to. And she would say, "Oh, I can't write a check. I'm so nervous," uh, you know. So it was. Um, I was always very independent uh, that way. Just to be uh, remembered as a good person, I think that's all I can can think of. I spent I've spent my life looking after people, so that's all I think I want to be remember, remembered by. I'm such a I'm a very independent person, and I'm going to look after myself till the last breath. I think, uh, and um, I. I don't, like, everybody offers to do things and I thank them very much, that's very nice, but I'll carry on and do it my way. Uh, and um, I just saw some, this is off the track, about the lady that married the, the first wife of Ernest Hemingway. And she was the, uh, a very well-known and first woman war correspondent at World War One, and they said, you don't say no to her, and if you do, she doesn't listen anyway. <laughs> so, I'm something like that. <laughs> it's, it's always been with me, right, from the day, the day I was born, I think it was. And um, I sort of thought everything on my, on my own, and if ever I was sort of in trouble, uh, like throughout my adult life even, I can always think of, two or three things to get me out of that trouble. I, you know, I don't just throw my hands in the air and, and give up. I don't think it's not, I think it's because I've been on my own, you know, quite a bit. So you have to do your own thinking. I have nobody to say, you know, to um, get advice from, which I probably wouldn't listen to anyway. <laughs>